Hi, everyone, and welcome to End of Life University podcast, where we share real talk about life and death. I'm your host, Dr. Karen Wyatt. Thanks for joining me here for episode number 236. In just a little while, I'll be sharing with you a conversation I had with my guest, Jean Denny. We'll be talking about reconnecting life and death. And Jean is a return guest to the podcast. I last interviewed her almost four Four years ago, when we talked about some a study she was doing on the importance of presence at the bedside of nonverbal patients. So Jean is going to continue to enlighten us today with her work and her wisdom around life and death. And it's a really important discussion. Uh, But before we get there, just a couple of quick announcements. I'm off this week for Bozeman, Montana, heading there for the Mountains of Courage Conference, where I'll be the keynote speaker. And I'm very excited about that. Looking forward to meeting people in Bozeman who are are involved in end of life work. And then May 7th through 10th, I'll be speaking at Rutgers University and also doing a workshop in New York City, as well as some book signings there for my new version, uh, Seven Lessons for Living from the Dying, which is being published again by Watkins Publishing from the United Kingdom, and it is being released that week in the UK, but also here in the US. So I'll be doing book signings in New York City during the week of May May 9th and 10th, around around there sometime. So if you're in that area, just pencil it in on your calendar, because I'd love to see you there. Also today, I'd like to thank all of my supporters who have been making monthly contributions on my page at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash E-O-L-U. Your small monthly donations are helping to keep this podcast on the air, and I am ever grateful to you. If you'd like to join the team, go to that web address to see what it's all about. There are some special bonuses like... uh, an end-of-life news update, which comes out once a month. I've just recently posted the news update for the month of February. And you'll also, from time to time, get movie reviews that my husband and I do on films that deal with death, dying, or grief. So just a couple of the fun bonuses that you can get when you sign up to be a supporter on Patreon. So now we'll get on with the interview with Jean Denny, and I'll remind you, as always, to stay tuned until the very end, and I'll be back with a few takeaways and to say goodbye. So here we go. Today, I'm excited to welcome back my guest, Jean Denny, and Jean and I talked, it's now been almost four years uh, when we talked about a study she was doing on nonverbal patients, but Jean is into a new form of work right now that we're going to talk about today. So I'll tell you a little bit about her. Jean is the founding director of the School of Unusual Life Learning, or SOUL, S-O-U-L-L, a transpersonal and somatic psychotherapist. She's a hospice worker, a healer, and the author of The Effects of Compassionate Presence on the Dying. Jean's insights on energy and the body through aging, illness, and dying are derived from a wide lens of human experience and deep understanding of our mortal journey. And you can and should visit her website so that you can learn a lot more about this work she's doing. It's at jeandenny.com, and that's J-E-A-N-N-E-D-E-N-N-E-Y, a lot of N's and E's. <laughs> <That's com. true. laughs> and uh, learn more about Jean's work mm-hmm. there. And Jean, thank you for joining me. It's so nice to have a chance to talk to you again. Yeah, thank you, Karen. I'm delighted. Yeah, especially to talk about this work. So let's go. Yes, yes. I can't wait to dive into it and learn more about it. So from what and from, from reading about your work, you started as, in end-of-life work and death education, but in the new school that you've created, you're really focusing more on life, unusual life learning is in the name of your school. Mm-hmm. So maybe you could just 
give us the big picture in a way for everyone listening. Tell us a little more about your journey, how you first got interested in working with death, and then what led you to this place where you're creating a school about life processes? Well, that's great. Great question. Well, actually, my work in death and dying didn't start in a vacuum. It started uh, the way many people's work in this field does, and that's after the death of somebody close to them. In my case, it was my mother. And the minute she died, almost within a few weeks, I knew that I I needed to leave my career, which I was a bridge engineer. Um, At that time, I already had done some uh, training and healing work. Um, learning about energy and chakras and human development. And I felt a strong call to move in that direction. So uh, really, I began to do hospice volunteering at, at that point. And I began it with all of my questions about what's really happening here. What is really going on in this process of dying? Uh, I would go into the nursing homes after my children were asleep, as I think I might have said in the other interview, and and I could see people's bodies changing over periods of time, and it started giving me insights on um, human development. At the same time, my own children were growing. I had four of them. They were probably between about six and, you know, 13, and their bodies were changing in a different direction. And uh, through this transition, I I, uh, started to do a graduate degree in transpersonal psychology, a postgraduate program in somatic psychotherapy, which taught me more about human development and energy. Uh, I started to do volunteering as a birth doula as well. And somehow between all of those activities, birth, death, growth, uh, decline, spirituality that I was learning about and uh, all of these things were shaped me together so they really were not separable for me and uh, so it's almost impossible for me to teach to tease uh, death education out of life education I I think in fact we find they're almost the same things Um, so that's a start to that question Hmm. Um, very interesting. And, and I do agree with you that there's, there's so much, uh, we, we cannot separate death from life. In fact, they're interwoven. And in some ways, we put, we're putting a big emphasis now on trying to learn about death. But if we're doing that outside the context of life, then we're still missing part of the equation. Yeah, and I remember when I first got started, uh, in hospice, I, I had the sense that some of the people who feared death the most were actually people who didn't seem to know what it was like to be really alive. Mm-hmm. And so I was wondering if that, if, if you have sensed that as well, that, that there's a question, if we don't understand death, is it because we also don't really understand life and what life is? Absolutely. I mean, I think any of us that have spent any time in this field, generally there's a trajectory, right? We get excited about the fact that we can even approach death. We learn, uh, we realize we can learn about it, that we get a certain vitality out of doing it, then we can teach others. And then at some point, you, like many other people, Henry Frisco Weiss and many others, Stephen Jenkinson, uh, we, we come to a point where we realize maybe, maybe this basic construct of death versus life is wrong. I mean, we kind of go, wait, wait a second. We're going to death to learn about life. But, you know, we find ourselves come, becoming more enlivened by approaching these topics, right? And that's a puzzle. Right. And that was, of course, the puzzle I was working on. And it really is embedded into my DNA, really, that <laughs> that whole thing. So I think one of the things uh, we really have to move toward in uh, death and life work is the real understanding that death and life are the same thing. They're made of the same thing. They, they do not exist uh, without each other. And, and maybe even why that's so. And how we can work with it. Hmm. And so 
you began as a death educator and you're now a life educator. And from that perspective, is what you're doing different? Has it changed from being a death educator to a life educator? Yeah, well, like you say, I almost couldn't do them separately. In fact, it's probably more accurate to say I didn't start as a death educator and become a life. It it was more like I was a somatic psychotherapist who did hospice work (laughs) and (laughs) death education work with students and others. And I've been trying to build the bridge between them. Both of those fields uh, need what the other one offers. For example, somatic psychotherapy, many people may not know what that is, but that's a, a kind of psychotherapeutic work that acknowledges the body the energy system, and uh, is quite effective uh, in in helping people work through things, um, trauma in particular. But in my psychotherapy training, in somatic psychotherapy, uh, there was almost, there was nothing nothing about life after about age 25 when we're fully developed as if nothing that happened after 25 was interesting right Mm -hmm. and uh there was a real bias uh, against death and the real opposition of death versus life was in that field because that's was a 20th century idea uh, that sexuality was where life was that death was the opposite of that um, and also in, in, my, in the death education uh, area, um, we, you know, really didn't learn much about the body and uh, how the body could be really useful. Understanding the body and energy could be really useful to helping people and understanding our own lives. So I think I've been building that bridge between uh, those two, two bodies of of work and trying to find a way both to teach it, but also a kind of a new, new um, theoretical construct for it. And I I wanted to say, I love the fact that you mentioned um, in discussing your story a little bit that you started out as a bridge engineer and here you are, you're still building bridges. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I just didn't get it on the right level first of all. (laughs) Yeah. but, But I think that's wonderful. And when I look back to my medical education, and I, I feel a little bit shocked now in some ways at how little death was ever even addressed or, or acknowledged in all of the training that I received um, for all of those years, medical school and residency alike. And um, I think that's a, that has become a huge problem now within our medical system because we don't have doctors who are trained to know how to embrace dying and death as part of the life cycle of their patients and part of just the natural course of what their patients are going to experience. Yeah, it, it's, it, I, I like the way you said that, um, but it's almost as if this idea that we can train doctors, which I think would be useful, truthfully. I mean, I think there's, I think, um, uh, my friend Leslie Blackhall talks you know, about how little uh, doctors get, um, maybe a couple of hours in their entire training, if that, as if we could train this. And that's, what com- that's where we come to the school and its ideas in a way, because I think it's more than even training. We actually have to undo some of our understandings about life that we were given, particularly in places like biology classes and medical schools. And those highly scientific views of life that were active in the 20th century and late probably 19th century said that death was opposite of life. That really got imprinted. And once you begin to adopt that idea that life is on one side, death is on the other, there becomes this very sharp edge between us, them. And you, you work like heck to stay away from that edge, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a very, very different point of view than the idea that life is uh, the thing that moves um, things in and out of forms and and back in 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 some kind of natural way. That's an entirely different uh, worldview, in fact. So how do we get under the worldview? It isn't probably just a couple of hours of training, even though that would be useful, the worldview itself is what leads us to the ICU death, truthfully, that nobody really wants to have. It's so true. And, the, and that worldview, it's cultural, it's societal, it's ingrained in each and every one of us. And we really have to confront it within ourselves. I think if we, if we want to try to change how, how we're approaching 
the end of life and, and life in general for our patients or for people that we work with. Yeah, absolutely. And then the question becomes, and this is exactly kind of the path that I walked, like you, uh, through, why is it this way? And why is it that way? And couldn't this be better? And I think ultimately I came to the idea that uh, what was needed was a, a way to teach people how to see things from that different worldview. Uh, not just even the idea that there's a different worldview, which you know many people listening to this podcast would probably agree with, but how we actually feel that in our bodies, experience our vitality, understand our vitality, and, and work with our own resistance to death that's been given to us in the culture. And I, know, I gathered from your website that you talk a lot about um, the problems that arise from our separation from the natural world. And I was wondering if you talk about that a little bit more and also about how you address that in your school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, nature is the classroom for teaching about life, period. <laughs> it is the classroom. So, But let's just think about nature for a minute. I mean, one of the principles of nature is that things die. I mean, that's a, that's a core principle that things pulsate, and that means they expand and they contract, right? And, and they do that with some kind of fluidity, and I think that's what we call naturalness, that we, we have ease with change. We can flow. We can uh, transform uh, with grace, usually, uh, some of the time at least. <laughs> and that's what naturalness kind of is, authenticity. We don't resist movement. The minute we oppose dying processes from, or expansion processes from contraction processes, let's say, like growth from aging, the minute we make those very separate things, we start to resist one of them. And that almost creates this artificiality in our system. We become, you know, all kinds of things are connected to that in our own bodies, in our uh, minds, in our emotional systems, and our environment, our politics, and our medicine. You know, it becomes very vast when you watch what it means to separate death from life. Um, I hope this is making sense. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, well, I, I can see that um, our own resistance to seeing our own death as part of life causes us to view ourselves as separate from or different from the natural world because we can look at nature and it's obvious that death is part of life in nature, but we really don't want to see that within ourselves. Correct, yeah. And, and that's a picture of how much we've separated ourselves from nature, mainly because of this fear of death thing, as far as I can see. Um, and, and, and it causes so many uh, issues, not just at bedside where many death doulas and death hospice workers and so on experience it, not just in grieving processes, all through the lifespan. And that's where being a somatic psychotherapist at the same time really showed me that this was not a deathbed issue. It was not an issue that just comes up when you get a difficult diagnosis or somebody dies in your life. This is actually uh, something that's behind um, the anxiety of people in their 20s, um, people that are suicidal, all kinds of life issues that we see and people um, in a lot of torment because of really the wrong ideas about this and who they are, not being disconnected from their authenticity, their body, their truth. And uh, so these, the school I'm creating anyway is, is one of the ways that I'm, I'm trying to address that in a context that helps people go quite a bit further into connecting with themselves. Mm. And so do you actually spend time in nature with your students dur during your classes? Yeah, actually. Um, well, I set up, the question was, how am I going to teach this, right? I mean, yeah. how, how do you set up a context people are willing to come to, uh, make it enough of a commitment to, and um, not overwhelm, you know, not overwhelm. And so I, I started with a three weekend uh, structure with some online education in between. Now, I want to point out that uh, it really does require some thinking to undo the thinking we have. We have to be first become aware of how 
what we think that we don't even know we think <laughs> about life and death and and then start to recognize how it's running our system and that takes some lecture and you know the usual kind of workshop uh, interactions and experimentation and self reflection but um there's two ways i think i really try to help people experience these ideas and um that's through experiential work um no matter where we are, you know, in, in the house that I teach in or outside, um, but also in people's reflection in the natural world, that's a requirement of the course is that we, is you really do start to examine your relationship with nature uh, in a variety of ways. And we do, um, we try to be outside for exercises as much as we can. Um, so we start to break down that, that artificial wall. Hmm. That sounds very interesting. And I, I like the fact that you emphasize that it, it does take some work for us to recognize the mindset we've, we've been taught or that has been ingrained in us right. um, through our society. And that it takes a little bit of sussing out in a way in order to see the effects of that in our own lives. Yeah, it really does. And and yet I'm surprised in, in another way how easy it is. And if, if you'd like, I'll give you an example. Yeah. Um, and I start most of the teachings with this. So this is a spoiler alert here. But uh, and I have for years. I, I tell a story about teaching um, at Rampo College uh, when I was an adjunct there teaching death and dying. And I wanted um, the students to get who thought that this class was going to be about trauma generally when they came in I wanted them to get a sense of the naturalness of both dying but also of life movement and so I had this idea aha I'm going to show them um, time-lapse videos of plants because uh, time you know plants stay put and we get these wonderful videos showing life moving through things a life force has a pattern and something about that is so uh, resonant for us that we feel it you know when we watch life uh, time lapse videos so that was my idea and I got online and started looking for time lapse videos to show the naturalness of the expansion to the contraction and how easy it was well guess what I found um, I found that you know of the 330,000 videos that came up um, on flowers uh, growing or whatever I, I, I uh, searched and many other searches, uh, almost all of them only showed you the plant growing to the point of its maximum bloom, uh, say the flower opening, right at the point where the flower might start to contract, the videographer would cut and start another flower blooming. Mm. If you can imagine this, you see nothing in the flower itself was doing that. That was our projection about what life was and, and that it was so, um, it was so common. It was as if all the videographers signed a contract that said they would not let us see the moment when that flower starts to contract. But also there were a very a small number of videos that would show flowers dying. And that also had our images of trauma and sadness and collapse in them. And so it was a big pro projection screen, right, of our, of our culture's ideas about these processes. I find that so fascinating and in many ways not surprising at all. It, it makes sense to me that we prefer not to look at the decline and the deterioration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That oh, I just found my thread so I can go back in. Yeah. And it's interesting that it isn't, it's the moment between expansion and contraction that seems the most charged for people like that. I even found videos that showed the expansion and showed the contraction, but they interrupted the moment when it changed mm -hmm. as if these are two separate processes that that life versus death thing came right through in the videography. So I show this to students and I say, look, this is what I found and everybody recognizes it. And I say, this is in all of our advertising, all of our processes. We, we are carrying this inner idea and it's being reinforced to us daily. But all it takes is for me to find one video to show them, it just shows them enough of the full life movement 
that instantly in their bodies, they can feel that relief. Hmm. And, and uh, that sometimes those little talks that I do, people have big changes from that. So, so it can take a lot, but um, the art is in helping people really connect with their life as the movement of energy within them happening right now, not off someday in the future, you know, they're going to become spirit or something. It's happening now. And I think that that, Learning how to teach people that has been um, where I've gone with with this work. Mm. And as you were talking there, I was reminded of a hospice patient I worked with once who asked me, uh, when do I stop living and start dying? Would you tell <laughs> me when that when that happens and like when that changes? And I said, wait a minute. <laughs> I said, you're you're doing both at the same time you're living all of us we're living but we're also dying in some ways those two processes are happening at the same time and she said no they're not (laughs) uh, and she said and I just want to know when I make that transition and I could not I couldn't get through to her (laughs) that there that they were not two separate processes. It just as you're absolutely, thinking. yeah. And it, even you start looking deeply, and that's of course what we're trying to do in this project. When you start looking deeply, it becomes clear. But you can hear in that life versus death uh, that we that we think that life is growth and expansion phase, and that death is anything other than that. Um, And that actually, I often put up the biology online uh, dictionary definition of life. And that one says that uh, life is a characteristic of of matter, basically. And it was characterized by growth, by reproductive ability, by metabolism, ability to adjust to to stimuli and adaptability, those five things. Now, I want to ask you. If you're an older person, you're no longer growing in our the way we use that word physically, your metabolism is slowing down, you're not reproducing anymore, you're not adapting as easily, um, you may not even be responding as, as quickly to things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, why wouldn't we feel like we're becoming less alive if that's our definition? And of course, people are going to be in crisis about it. But when we shift to a definition of life that includes life force movement, the awareness of life force movement and life as energy in motion, that entirely shifts. Mm, I love that term, life force movement. Could you talk a little bit more about that? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I I do talk about it. And and I think... I think that people often just have big question marks on their faces when I say it because it's so alien to us. Life force movement. First of all, what's a life force? I've never heard of that, right? (laughs) And science would say there's no such thing as life force. And yet if we watch those time-lapse videos of flowers growing, we can absolutely see that there's a force pushing matter upwards. Something's happening, right? So, um, So I think that this is a basic kinesthetic uh, sense that has been um, almost interrupted in us. It's natural for us to have a kinesthetic sense of life force movement. And yet in our culture, we're almost uh, hindered uh, by not having it. I think other cultures, uh, tribal cultures and indigenous cultures often made sure that people understood and could experience um, the rhythm of life and understood those cyclical na- the cyclical nature of life. But uh, in ours, it's almost as if we avoid or we um, try to make sure we don't put those pieces together. I, I, I don't know why, um, but uh, it causes a lot of problems. That's, I would say that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very true. And I have to admit, I've, I've experienced it over and over again. And I'm only just now, after reading your material, beginning to look at how have these, how has this mindset influenced me as much as, I myself try to teach about the cycle of life and, you know, life encompasses both birth and death, but are there ways that I'm even blind to within myself that I've been affected by this split between living and dying? Yeah, it's amazing, right? It, 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 one of those remarkable things to me is that once we start changing our ideas, and I, of course, uh, like to do this in group settings, 
so that we can really reinforce each other and, and be helped by it. But once we start doing it, our, our bodies itself start to recognize our awareness. It's amazing. As one of my students said, it's as if I'm wired to, to know about this life aware, force awareness thing, but the switches were all turned off. And uh, in doing this study, they were turned back on. And, and it's gradual. It keeps sinking in and sinking in. And uh, it's an ongoing process, as another student likes to say, you know, it, it goes well beyond the six months of study. It keeps like rich soil. It just keeps feeding you. Um, I think that's true. That's, that's what a true initiation is like. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Jean, do you feel that uh, the teaching that you're doing, the somatic education, the unusual <laughs> unusual life learning. Um, do you feel like it would be beneficial for people who do end of life work? Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, any kind of life work, uh, uh, because I think honestly, uh, often death and dying folks work very much by themselves. Um, and, and can be for one thing, I think it can be really hard, um, to be in isolation and not understand the energetic dynamics of what you encounter every day uh, with either patients, if you're in, a, in an agency or, uh, you know, in relationship dynamics with people dying, it gives you a, an incredible insight on, on what the dynamics are. Uh, one, let me just give you an example. My friend, Amy Cunningham, who I'm sure you've interviewed, who's a mortician in Brooklyn, um, she came to one of our weekends and we learned a little bit, just a little bit about the energetics of relationships between people and how they change through death. And Amy took that uh, idea of the cords uh, back and she, said she had used it many times with families, just helping them describe what's happening to them. And for example, in grief, why is it that our bodies are so impacted by another person's death? There are so many ways, and I, I probably could give you more examples, uh, just how you work with a dying patient and so on. But we just, uh, this first six months program, we just try to give, uh, I, I say the goal is to give you a new life language. And then in year two, uh, we're really taking it into applications. And I will be very excited to get some folks working actively in death and dying in that year too, which mm. I don't have yet. And I wonder if I, I'm thinking about some questions I've been asked by uh, family members who are caring for a patient with Alzheimer's and who have felt that they can no longer relate to their loved one. They can't mm -hmm. feel a connection anymore mm -hmm. to their loved one. And mm -hmm. it sounds to me like they could use some of the work that you're doing to help them still sense this, the life force in, in their loved one, even though... Um, their their mental abilities have changed to, to still feel. Yes, yeah. Well, uh, even though I probably at this point wouldn't teach, uh, say, a death doula how, what to do, I think what the school is doing is giving you tools so that you can see what's needed and enter into a situation like, say, a couple in that situation and help them. And I'm happy to give an example of somebody I did that with recently in which I was able to just help him understand that there were levels that they could still relate on, even if the ones that, you know, we're attached to and used to are gone. And sitting them together uh, with a little bit of music, maybe helping helping the, the partner of the Alzheimer's patient uh, go into a meditative state and uh, find each other, uh, things like that. Um, I think we can think of things like that to do, when we understand a little bit more about what the actual processes are that they're going through in, in changing their relationship and their contracts with each other. And that's been really helpful to people just to have an experience of connection again. Mm. And I can see some reflections of the work we talked about in our initial interview, the study that you were doing on, I think, connections with nonverbal patients. Yes. <laughs> and I, I, can see the, I can see the same thing. It, it's being able to sense that energetic bond that is still there through everything. And and being and knowing how to how to become aware of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think there are actually technical aspects to it, actually. 
um, that we have to learn, you know, just like you learned your medical training. We tend to become a little amorphous when we're talking about these things and, you know, uh, relationships at end of life. We know that we're in the presence of mystery. We know that energy happens and that things influence each other. But sometimes it's good to understand that there's actual kind of processes. One thing happens before the other, and this is what helps that. And, um, you know, just briefly, since we're talking about death and dying work, and of course, it's not uh, confined to death and dying work, what I'm saying. Uh, but for example, if you have are with a patient who's non-communicative, and of course, they taught me an enormous amount about this. You're with someone who's struggling, say, you may not even know them very well, but you could tell they're struggling to really climb the ladder energetically to get out of their body uh, energy from other people can help you and even though a person might be trying to bring their energy up to the upper body generally we think of it in death sometimes pulling their their energy down to their feet can be really helpful and uh, for example and knowing that helping them come back down and ground for a moment and come back in, I call that the slingshot, can sometimes help people go back up, if I'm making sense. So seeing that pulsation within the dying process, that teaches me a lot about how people are in, in ordinary life, too. So we look at those patterns, if mm. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. So I can definitely see the applications of this training and how valuable it could be, especially because many times in end of life work, um, we're trained for certain standard situations that we can expect, but most often we end up <laughs> encountering <laughs> unusual situations and circumstances yeah. when we feel like I actually have no idea what to do, exactly. <laughs> no idea how to help exactly. you, but having more tools to offer and a new mindset in, in way for how to look at what's happening, I think could be so helpful. Exactly. It helps you stay more present and get more curious uh, in, a, in a really positive way. Where, where you, you can find things to do rather than feeling lost, for example. Like I always loved it when I didn't have a standard situation. Those taught me the most, right? <laughs> or something uh, unexpected happened. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. That's what stretches us the most and, and allows us to be the most creative, too. Well, isn't it something we love about death work, too? Those of us that have done it for years or have spent years doing it that it teaches us about life. It's a marvelous teacher taught me almost everything, you know? Uh, I guess that's where I got started. Yeah. Well, so one big concern I still have that I see on, changing only very, very slowly is the medical system itself and how we fail to approach the end of life, I think, in any reasonable way, how patients were using technology to, to prolong life, but were actually prolonging the dying process mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. And, oh, I don't even know, where can we begin within our medical system to, right. try, to <laughs> try to change that mindset? Do you have, well, other than I, I, sending everyone through your, through your class? I'll bring them on, you know. I yeah. actually, in Krakow, Poland, I was teaching, uh, working with aging, illness, and dying in uh, January, and I had three physicians and a dentist and some nurses in there, and it was so wonderful. They they were so um, amazed. Actually, they were they were open to it. Uh, I I guess that's what it's going to take. It's just having people with a new uh, vocabulary about what's going on here. Um, what's going on here is not necessarily. Um, biochemical or pulse rate or, you know, all the measurements we're doing, although that's certainly true and helpful sometimes. But when we can back up and look at it as a process of the, that's a normal process, a process we might be trying to help, we can bring that technical mind into a different direction that is more helpful. And um, I guess this is the technician in me coming out, but we have to have more rigorous ideas uh, about energy and the body and uh, to create a technology that's more humane. We have to have a different idea about what life is and stop opposing it from death to start creating a technology that's humane. Mm. 
So true, because right now our medical system is really serving that split between living and dying. It's focusing solely on living and fostering the split. I have always had this fantasy of what if, what if primary care doctors were trained to the first visit with a patient to say, I'm actually here to teach you about the cycle of life and death and that that life contains death and that all of us will die one day. And it's really important in your medical care that you understand that. <laughs> things that will support your life, but they but we are not doing that to prevent your death because we can't. <laughs> these are yeah, all yeah, yeah. wrapped up yeah. like what if doctors said that and then I realized <laughs> how far away we are from that. <laughs> being right, right. Yeah, it reminds me of another thing that I actually do say sometimes when I have the opportunity to work with somebody who's got um, serious cancer and this life versus death comes up about, do I do more treatments or do I give up? Right. I'm sure you've had that yes. many times. Like, like do, do I fight or do I surrender? You know? And it's like, wait a second. No, uh, actually every, you start getting ready for your dying because every single thing you do for your dying is going to help your healing. It, it, it's can't be different. They're not separate processes. Mm. So I always encourage people, yeah, plan for your death. Absolutely. <laughs> That's not being negative. Everybody should do it. And you'll find exactly what you need to correct in your life. Sometimes that can start a healing process right, mm -hmm. in the body. So the body knows about all these things and may actually be suffering from our misguided ideas about, you know, death. <laughs> So it's so true. It's so true. I, I I was just thinking of my mother who at one point in her life she had developed some health program problems and wasn't able to walk anymore and had kind of decided, I'm done with life. I don't want to be alive anymore. She started planning for her death. She started planning her funeral and she actually really enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> it led to many conversations between us about death and dying and about life as well she lived for five years and in some ways they were the best five years of her later life that yeah. she had ever had because once she addressed death she she felt this huge freedom like this weight came off of her shoulders and she was able to really enjoy what the things that she was still able to do and the parts of her life that she st that were still available to her yeah and she probably had a a little bit of an insight as to what her priorities were too, which think about everything you just said, how much that enhances our health and vitality to do the things we love, to be clear about what we actually enjoy and what's important to us, but what actually enhances our vitality. It's, um, you know, these are the ways we, we learn that death and life are not oppositional. In fact, they, they are by necessity the same process uh, in a way. They just are moving perhaps in, you know, two different directions or something. <laughs> I think that, that's such an important message uh, because often I think in, those of us who work in the do death work and work in the end of life arena, we're focusing on here's why you need to look at death because it will make your last days, your end of life better. Your dying process will be better if you look at death now, but we should actually be including, it's going to make your life be better right, right. now and for however many days you have it. And that's why people should start doing it at a younger age, in fact, and not wait until a month before. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, right. Here's another piece I'm sure is true for you too, Karen, not to assume, but, uh, I know that for me, uh, one of the big ahas was getting into hospice work and realizing that there was a lot I could not do in the period that I had to work with people because there was so much that hadn't been thought about. And that period of time was just not an optimum time to open up those questions. That's what turns you from a hospice uh, worker to a death educator, <laughs> where you want to go work with 21-year-olds who, by the way, are very anxious to hear about all this. Um, and so it, it it's what makes you see there's no special time in life to be learning this. Oh, I'll wait till after I'm 75. Oh, I'll wait till I'm sick. Uh, in in Tibet, you know, this is the ABCs for children, as the Dalai Lama says. So uh, these are our ABCs. 
and to learn that we're part of nature, to learn that this is part of our nature, and to learn how to work with it uh, skillfully. Mm -hmm. So true. Oh, wow. We have such a long way to go, but I, I'm really excited to hear about what you're doing because it seems like this is groundbreaking. I haven't seen um, much else out there offering this kind of training that you're doing. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of true. I, I think that's why I call it unusual. Um, it's hard for people to get their head around what I'm doing because we do split these things off from each other so much. Um, and uh, I do think there is a, a, an aspect here which I'm bringing together two fields that haven't been in this kind of contact in our Western culture um, in, you know, <laughs> since we've had modern science, let's just say, or psychology. Um, and uh, so I, I think that it's extremely fertile ground for learning uh, for all kinds of people that work with people. And for example, I have one student who, young, young person who's uh, getting her MSW is working in a grade school with children coming in with all of their angst about life in the world. How are they going to grow up? You know, they feel the climate crisis. And, and because of our work, I mean, she's able to work with plants with them and talk to them about it in a way without maybe joining their trauma in the same way. Um, there's so many applications we can make from basic uh, different vocabulary and understanding about life. Mm. So, so you mentioned teachers and you've mentioned healthcare professionals. Um, who else, who do you feel that your training is right for? <laughs> well, uh, one of my students says, just human beings. <laughs> and that is kind of true. Although I have to say the people that are most attracted to it, it's no, not one any demographic in terms of profession or age uh, but I think that uh, I call it wisdom keepers, healers, creatives tend to be drawn to it. They're working on these issues anyway. Um, and uh, people in human service work certainly should be thinking about what they're doing, I hope. Um, but the people that have these certain quality of question open, and you could be very young, you could be 18 years old and have this burning question open for you. And it doesn't matter you know, um, whether you know anything about anything, you can come and understand this course. Uh, actually, <laughs> one of my beloved teachers, uh, myself from years ago of somatics, and uh, one of my teachers of presence, the presence work, uh, Marcus Daniels, uh, surprised me by coming to be a student last year. And he had spent uh, 30 years with Tibetan Lamas, a pretty hardcore study with them, and he said, you know, I got things from this course I did not get from 30 years with the Lamas uh, about death and dying and vitality. Um, so I'm not saying that to boast, but I think it's just simply that's the range, right? Uh, from, uh, say, a young person or a millennial who's, in, who's kind of in life crisis to this very seasoned teacher. And, and everyone kind of can get it. <laughs> so I think it's more... Um, where your questions are, what's drawing you, and uh, whether you're really curious about this, this, um, this connection and longing to connect these ideas. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like many of the attendees are people in, in some sort of a helping profession who, who work with other people who might be looking at this course as a way to have more tools available for their work. But in the process of it, they may find that they themselves are, are totally changed. <laughs> by, by Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly it. And uh, yeah, so, and, and that was a surprise for me. Okay. So when I first started, I just was wondering why we weren't talking about um, death and dying and somatic psychology. So I got some colleagues together for a weekend and said, okay, surely they've thought about it too. And we'll get together and brainstorm and I'll show them what I'm doing. Well, it turns out they just didn't have very many things. They, they shared experiences, of course, and it was wonderful, but I ended up teaching this material for the first time. And my big shock was two weeks later, I had a Zoom call where we, I said, so where did you go with what we did? And almost to a person, people said it completely changed my life and talked about all the personal changes that had happened to them. 
um, and, and the help. Of course, it went into their work, uh, which is probably why they came there in the first place. But uh, they received so much on the personal level that allowed them to be so much more comfortable with the other people's life processes, too. So it's our own comfort with our own life movement that's going to make us um, skilled enough to be with other people's life processes uh, with confidence, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the primary gift of that first six months. Hmm. Even if you just come to the first weekend, which it's possible for people to do that, just come for one weekend. I think you get that feeling. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about how the course is structured. Yeah, sure. Um, well, because I work with nature, I, uh, I like to work with the seasons as much as I can. And so I start in the spring uh, with the first weekend, which I call the nature of being human. And in that weekend, we look we work with a lot of the things we've been talking about in this interview about how uh, the body is formed, how the body, how we start to age and the dying process and what dying people show us and the energetics of dying and so on. We get on the floor every day. We do some practices with dying visceral practices. So we can really see how much this is nested in our own body now and expand that uh, capacity. That's weekend one. And it's a lot. Uh, but we know very well that nobody's dying process, uh, nobody dies completely alone, right? Or if they do, there are relationships somewhere that they're in conversation with. Uh, so relationships are a very big part of dying. And in weekend two, uh, which usually takes place a couple months later, and uh, during that two months, we have online dialogues and discussions and homework, weekly homework if you want to do it that helps you anchor the weekend one teaching. In weekend two, we look at the structure of relationships, the nature of, of relationship. And uh, we find that, that relationships have a, are their own, uh, they have their own life force, they have their own way of coming into being, and that they have their own rhythm, they have their own patterns. Uh, and that when people are dying, they have characteristic ways that we let go of certain of our energy attachments to people. And um, that's a lot of teaching to do uh, that, that weekend, and we experiment with that. Um, and so that's the second weekend, about two months later, or two and a half, three, like, depends on the year. That's in the summer. So we are sometimes out roaming around outside uh, doing experiments <laughs> on relationship. Um, and then we have another couple of months to integrate that. And the third weekend, we, we also know that there's something about community in the dying process, too, about who a community receiving who we've been and um, something that the dying person can give to a community that's almost like food for our, our uh, connections with each other. And that's a mystery I was really fascinated with. So I knew that there was a community aspect to our life changes and what helps us bond and connect and understand who we are in this world. So that's what we look at in um, the third weekend. Uh, it's almost infinitely hard to get your head around that, but I think we can learn a few processes about how groups work, um, how all of these energies start to make sense together. Uh, and that's pretty big when you start seeing how your family uh, dynamics and, and then also your community dynamics are. Um, so, and then uh, usually that's, that's the end. Um, then we have a little discussion afterwards to see how everybody's landing. And then people go into a very quiet place usually at the end of the program. And I consider that the the, the, the final part in the winter where we go in to really integrate the material. Um, that's, that's the program. Wow. That sounds amazing. And so, so where, where do you teach this? Where would people need to travel to in order to take that class? <laughs> well, I've been teaching it in New York. However, I just relocated to Wisconsin and I'm trying to establish this, this, uh, program here. So what I'm doing is teaching the first weekend in April, mid-April, I think it's the 16th through the 19th in New York, a Stony Point Center uh, this year coming up. 
and I'll be doing the weekend one in May, mid-May, here in Wisconsin. I live in Racine, in the Chicago-Milwaukee uh, kind of corridor. Um, and then the uh, there will be the second and third weekends will be here in Wisconsin. I hope people uh, who might be who want to do that might be willing to travel. I will also be doing a weekend one on Whidbey Island outside of Seattle in September. So um, the idea being, if I can bring that first weekend uh, to people, that's a benefit very often for folks. And, for some people, that's quite enough. And those that really want to take it deeper can um, can keep going. Oh, so that's interesting. So some people could just sign up for one weekend, either in New York City, in Wisconsin, or Seattle, and take the, the yeah. first weekend experience. And, you know, as you said, for some, that might be plenty. Yeah, <laughs> plenty to yeah integrate, exactly. As I guess, in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes, I, I think that... Uh, I, I realized that through teaching that that it was good to have the option of, of letting people stick their toe in. I, I know that it's a lot to consider doing three days uh, with strangers <laughs> and traveling to it, but it is well worth the uh, experience, I think, for most people. Uh, almost everybody uh, I've worked with for that first weekend, it's very helpful. So um, it's an offering for those that are called. And... Uh, the questions only deepen, but um, it's uh, it's available <laughs> if people want to shift their language. <laughs> how do uh, how do students sign up for it if they if someone listening is interested? Yeah, they can uh, drop me personally an email for one thing. That's my name, Jean Denny, and you spelled it at the beginning of the interview: J E A N N E D E N N E Y. But you can Google me. I'm sure you can find my website. And look up under the school, too, if you'd like to. On my website, jeandenny.com, there is a page on the school. And, and there is certainly an email contact in there. Just reach out. Say I'm interested. Um, I'm happy to set up a conversation with anybody that would uh, like to find out more or just to explore if it's the right time for them to do this. So it would be good for people to do that soon. Um, early bird registration is coming up um, in early March and early April for both of those um, New York and Wisconsin dates. But uh, would really would love to have uh, some death and dying folks with these these questions. And uh, yeah, I can I can just imagine some people uh, listening feeling called to this because maybe people who've been working in the death and dying field for a while and have felt in their hearts that something is missing in the work they do or the way they've been trained in the work they're doing. And that um, it sounds like this would certainly be a rich experience to, to, to help them come back home again in a way to their own bodies and, yeah. and connect more deeply. That is true. Uh, I find for people that are really uh, doing a lot of hospice work or death and dying work that it's important. The community aspect is important because often we don't get it in our work environments. It, I sometimes say, uh, you know, there should be OSHA regulations about doing death and dying work the way we're doing it energetically. We deplete people and burn them out so quickly. And there are reasons why in soul, we really are looking at what are those energetic dynamics that burn people out so radically. Uh, we should be doing this in groups, not just as individuals going in and, and really processing our experiences and uh, making sense and meaning out of what we're seeing. Those are very deep and important aspects to, um, to the work and self-care. Um, it isn't just getting a massage now and then or getting your nails done or going on vacation. It's understanding these deep energetic uh, processes we're in the middle of. So yes, uh, I would love to see one day us doing this, maybe even entirely for a group of death and dying uh, workers. But right now we mix it up with all kinds of people and I welcome everybody. Pretty much, unless you're in active crisis, then I don't know if it's the best thing for you at this moment. But uh, otherwise, I'm happy to speak with uh, mere mortals. <laughs> well, it's it sounds amazing. 
Yeah, it's very, very appealing to me. So, uh, well, come, Karen. You can come. <laughs> I'm really excited about about what you're doing, and uh, really impressed that you've um, that you've created all this, <laughs> had yeah. the inspiration for it, and you've actually done it and put it all together. Thank you so much. And I just want to compliment you too for giving a platform like this to speak about it. Uh, um, we've had a wonderful hour conversation and um, so often people want you to put things in very tiny sound bites. And actually, I just find that this particular work, it's very difficult to do that. <laughs> so um, I just want to thank you for the service that you're doing too. Oh, well, you're so welcome. And yeah, th and thanks for giving me your time so that we could talk about it. And, and hopefully um, we've gotten the message out to, to some people who, will, who know that it's the right thing for them. So. Yes, and this, this work goes based on colleague. I'm not trying to sell a program. I'm trying to make a, a resource available. So uh, for people that are really feeling that tickle of longing, that's who it's for. Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, so I'll just remind people to go to your website, jeandenny.com, and I will put a link to it in the show notes for this episode, which are at eolupodcast.com. And you'll find links to Jean's website and um, the school, kind of all, all the basic things we've talked about here on, yeah. on that page as well. Well, Jean, good luck, and it's, you'll soon be starting your your spring weekend so yep they're coming up so yeah. there's still time to jump on board <laughs> yeah thank you so much karen oh thank you take care all right bye I hope you enjoyed my interview with Jean Denny. I have to say that conversation gave me a lot of food for thought, particularly around the degree to which our entire Western medical system has separated life from death and chosen to entirely focus on life without incorporating death into the conversation. And it helped me realize that we need a lot more than just teaching doctors how to ask their patients questions about their end of life wishes, or how to even deliver bad news to patients, we really have to get down to the mindset, the culture, the belief systems around death and dying and life, and change our, our entire focus in medicine in order to make a difference in the medical system. So it seems like a daunting task on the one hand, but it also seems that, as Jean mentioned, when you start to work in this area, it becomes rather simple for people to understand. So I feel like those of us out there who are awake and aware of this message about the importance of incorporating death into our view of life, we can each make a big difference in the world if we take it upon ourselves to remind other people and to simply bring that message forward that, you know what, death is a natural part of the life experience. And if we leave it out, we're, we're missing the richness and the depth of life. So I encourage all of you out there to add that message to your conversations, including with people in the medical profession when you have opportunities so that we can gradually, one by one, start to change some of these mindsets that have been very destructive overall in the, in the way we offer health care to people, but particularly at the end of life. So I want to thank you once again to everyone who wrote in to me with comments and messages about the podcast episode from last week. I really appreciated it. And um, I'm so grateful to all of you who are regular listeners and keep showing up. I'm also grateful to those of you who might be listening for the very first time to this podcast. If you enjoy this content, please remember to share it with other people who might benefit from it. And if you're so inclined, go to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, Spotify, Google, wherever you happen to listen to podcasts and leave a review because that helps other people see the podcast who might be looking for this kind of information. So until next week, I'll say goodbye.
and remember that we're here for love. So face your fear, be ready for whatever life decides to bring your way, and love each and every moment of your time here on planet Earth. Bye-bye.